So as uh, Paula said, I'm well today, so I apologise sincerely if I'm coughing and spluttering. And also my slides are going to be pretty um, um, rough around the edges in parts, uh, partly because I've just not been well enough to give it the normal polish. Um, right, as I'm talking to you, I'm trying to tweak things. Uh, great. So I decided to talk about something which is um, hopefully accessible to a broad audience. I realise that there's a great mix of people in the audience, young, old, early career, later career, and also applied maths is very, very broad. So many of you will not uh, know much about the subject area that I have worked on in my career. So I thought it would be good to give a talk that offers insight in the way that people think and develop, you know, a, a discipline and how they interact personally between themselves. Uh, so it's it's got a large element of history about it. Unfortunately, as in the history of most of science, you go back 100 years and there's very few women. So all of the people I talk about, the early protagonists of diffraction theory, are all male. And I have to hold my hands up and apologize for that. However, um, my outline of a talk, I'm going to talk about equality, diversity and inclusion a little bit, just personal observations. Then I'll talk about diffraction theory. And then I'm going to talk to you about the Sommerfeld integral, which is one method that was developed, again, originally mainly by Sommerfeld, who is a an enormous figure in mathematical physics world. And then if I have time, and how much time I have, we'll get onto the Wienerhoff technique as an alternative, but I'll certainly manage, mention uh, Norbert Wiener and Eberhard Hopf, who are uh, interesting characters. So I'd, I'd like to bring in that flavor, um, whether I'll be able to get through to discuss how those the method works, uh, I'm not sure. So that's the, the plan. But as I say, um, let's start off with equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, let's start off thinking about that in the context of diffraction theory. As I said, almost exclusively men have dominated this field. And there's one woman in the audience who's a colleague of mine, Jane Laurie, who's worked in the field and I asked her yesterday how many people uh, before her um, have there been in the subject. And you probably could count them on on two hands or so. It really is a very, very small, small um, history of women in, in our field. And I when by diffraction theory, I really talk about the mathematical aspects of the subject, which I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so it's really awful. However, there is one notable exception in the mid 20th century, uh, and this figure will give it away. So this is figure 51 from the research of Rosalind Franklin. And I'm sure you will know that that's the diffraction pattern of a double helix. And from this figure, you can figure out that it's a double helix by various um, blobs dark and light patches. The cross tells you it's a it's a helix. And then this, um, this block, black blob here and the distance of it from the origin um, gives you some indication of a repeating sequence, uh, which is the base pairs of DNA. And these smaller blobs moving up here give you some indication of the pitch of the double he the helix. And the fact that this repeating sequence here has some uh, missing black blobs tells you that something is not quite right with the helix and it tells you that's a double helix. So this figure really revealed everything. And there's a lot of intrigue, as you know, about Rosalind Franklin having this picture uh, uh, stolen by uh, Crick and Watson and used in their, uh, it, to confirm their theories. And in fact, this is Rosalind Franklin's paper from 1953. Um, 
and it's a na published in Nature. And in fact, the famous Crick and Watson papers are in the same edition. Uh, this was the title of Rosalind Franklin's paper, Molecular Configuration in Sodium Thymonucleate. And uh, it's hidden in here, her contribution. However, we know the history of this and she wasn't recognized for what uh, she'd achieved uh, through this photograph, uh, this diffraction image. Um, and the world has talked about it ever since. But the question is, have things changed significantly from her days? And she died in 1957 or 58, uh, very young. <laughs> so have things changed in academia? Excuse me. So universities now pay much more lip service to equality, diversity and inclusion. And universities often state their mission and vision statements and all their virtues of how wonderfully caring they are. And undoubtedly, some universities are working hard to be truly inclusive and diverse. But are the fundamentals different? Have things changed? You know, I would argue there's leaky pipeline of people, women particularly, uh, pre-university, getting turned off by the system, going to university. And then during university life, uh, the difficulties associated in some universities, and I'll come up to that in a, in a, a moment. And then post-university, post-docking, or uh, sorry, post-docking in universities and then outside. Well, certainly for a postdoc, nomadic and unstable lifestyles are difficult. They're difficult um, and affect some people in our community more than others, and in particular women. Two body problems, cultural issues with lifestyle. Uh, I think the absolute metrics for research excellence and quality um, are still the same. We don't really take into enough count, uh, which is this penultimate bullet point for compensation for having dependence, non-standard career routes, non-standard contributions that you make. So I don't think that that's changed much. There's more pressure than ever on sources and amounts of research income. And again, that's hard for certain groups in our community trying to establish their careers. And this third bullet point from the end, I think is very important. There's little reward for being collegiate. If you take on large administrative jobs within your department or within the university, you uh, are very rarely um, really recognised and rewarded for it. And it can often impede or uh, um, cause difficulties with your career. And the last point is, of course, imposter syndrome. Some people feel it more than others. So... It's true that keeping your head down, being selfish with one time, is still the best strategy for academic success. I would argue that's still true. Why is that in this day and age? And the second bullet point, as money gets tighter, um, the universities are really finding life tough. And they then need to expect academics to bring in more and more money and larger sort of pots of money. So how do mathematicians compete when we have other subjects able to bring in much more money? And then within mathematics, if people have other commitments outside and it's much harder for them to form the networks to bring in big grants, how do we ensure that they're not um, penalized for that? But this third bullet point, I think, is really the critical one, thinking about it. I think many mass departments have an ED&I e, philosophy or, a, or, or a, you know, they have a strategy and might pay lip service to it. But is it properly embedded with their strategy and infrastructure? Does it really affect the way they think about their members of staff in terms of the jobs that they're asked to do and um, the, the promotions rounds? I would argue in most places it isn't. Uh, and this last bullet point, 
I think many universities rest on their laurels and despite lots of pressure, uh, don't see the need to change. And I have to uh, point out my own university, Cambridge, uh, which has between 15 and 20 percent women on the undergraduate programme, mathematical science tripos. Why is that acceptable? What incentives or punishments should be given to the department to try and, um, and, and improve these figures? Well, they've been the same for many years, so I don't think it's really been enough. Oxford does better than Cambridge. Uh, they made conscious efforts over the last 10 years to improve their gender balance, but it's still not great. And I'll just comment here on the women in the mathematical tripos. Um, Cambridge mathematics loses women faster than men. They transfer to other subjects. An inadequate, insensitive supervision by men is thought to be one of the reasons. So as you know, the Cambridge system does have supervisions within the colleges and there's a definite system which makes people feel um, um, inadequate easily if they're not the very best. <coughs> anyway, I'll pass, um, skip on those other points for the sake of um, getting through things. So just some comments on my role within ICMS and I. &I. For those who don't know, I was ICMS Scientific Director from 2014 to 2016, and then I, &I Director from 2016 to 21. And both institutions are powerful vehicles to change. So part of the reason why I took on these jobs was that I could actually um, use these um, these organisations to try and change uh, things and address cultural and unconscious bias biases. Um, and therefore seeing the your retreat uh, being based in ICMS is great and I really applaud it. Um, so um, early career researchers can really, really overcome many of the standard difficulties of gender, geographic location, um, lack of resources from uh, developing countries, etc., by being invited to long-term programmes, especially, but also workshops. So I think that's an important reason for us to sort of think about membership of or participation in events. Um, I also think that attendance um, at ICMS and I and I and I means that you can provide role models and development of spontaneous mentoring and support. Uh, I've seen many examples of that. People whose careers have been trained uh, changed by meeting uh, individuals or <laughs> women role models who they can then um, use to support them for many years into the future. Um, and I felt my role was to help everyone to feel that I and I and ICMS is for them. And I think that certainly I and I um, was often seen as being rather elitist within the mathematics community. And there were some areas of mathematical sciences uh, who never got a look in for programs. Hopefully that's changed and there's a, a new appreciation that they're much more inclusive. Um, and certainly during my time, we started developing sat satellite programs in the same way that ICMS has that satellite workshops and an induction course for new lecturers, etc. cetera. Um, so one of the things we did to try and put EDI and I in the heart of the programmes, uh, we worked very closely with the, the organisers um, on the participant numbers, their demographics, gender balance, uh, geographical location. We set up grants for people from developing countries who had uh, more more difficult routes to get to participate. And we made those uh, um, less of a barrier to attendance. And then also people with caring needs. We had a fund for that. Um, but it was surprising that how some subjects are far more tricky than others to convince or change. And just 
as a point of amusement. And um, this is, you can see these things on the internet, female conference speaker at, um, inclusion. And uh, there's a lot of these that I heard when I was a uh, director at INI um, as to why when uh, the workshops were um, being set up that they invited the plenary speakers were often all male or had one or two women. And so we certainly tested them against it and asked them why that was the case. And many of these um, excuses here were the ones used. So this one, no one has complained about this before. You would often have people saying, um, I've run loads of conferences. Why do we have to, uh, I and I, think about this? Um, and then this one, we need big name speakers and a few of those are women. And women just aren't interested in this field. So a subject like mathematical physics has a lot of very strong dominant male figures. And you could argue that that disincentivizes a lot of women from pursuing their career within mathematical physics. But that's not a, a reason, that's just an excuse. And if you think that women aren't interested in your field, then you should change the way you operate in your field to make it more accessible, more friendly to early career researchers, etc. Anyway, many of these are applicable, but we need to fight against them. Then finally, on the EDI front, another opportunity we had for community activity and I and I was um, planning and, and this, providing the seed funding for the National Academy for Mathematical Sciences, which I hope you're all aware of. Um, I'm a very enthusiastic supporter of this initiative and as well as providing the money through the I and I, uh, I work with a small team to create a green paper which set the broad parameters for the Academy. And in particular, we put ED and I at the heart of the Academy and we felt it was necessary to integrate it into all of its functions. So it's not just one section, you have an ED and I committee, which does something and then says how wonderful all we're doing, but puts it at the, in the heart of every committee, every function. And so it's much more than just a box ticking uh, element. And it allows you to think about cradle to grave issues related to mathematical sciences. And by having an academy which thinks from school teaching um, through universities, through uh, careers in mathematical sciences, then you can think very much more seriously about the people pipeline, things like desertification of mathematics programs around the country, etc. And the academy team, <coughs> and there's now uh, a large group involved in this, there's 70 odd people, many of whom I'm sure are in the audience today. Um, um had a consultation last year and uh there was uh, a lot of feedback uh, in regard to EDI and but I would just point out that although most were very strongly supportive some reservations about balancing representation with excellence were expressed and there was one response which had multiple authors I believe it with within part of the feedback which essentially said that there's a danger that if you try and balance representation you will compromise excellence i feel that that is a very old fashioned point of view and something we really need to fight against otherwise nothing changes that's just one final warning that, that we've still got some way to go to change hearts and minds okay so let's get on to the scientific part of my talk. At this point, I was hoping we would get some discussion going in the audience if I were there in person, but it's not possible in this setting, I'm afraid. Okay, so what is diffraction theory? Well, diffraction theory is how light or other waves um, uh, diffract or uh, are influenced by obstacles and um, 
when you go back to Hooke and Newton's time, there was a lot of discussion, of course, between the corpuscular theory of light and the wave theory of light. Uh, now we we think of it as this duality. This, but in those days, there was a great deal of discussion. <laughs> And the modern theory of diffraction began with Jung. And you may have, if you did physics A-level, have done Jung's slits, which is shine light through uh, two slits together, and you get the interference patterns. And he broke with Newton's views, um, and he postulated that light was a longitudinal motion in the luminiferous, luminiferous ether. Um, longitudinal, not, not necessarily... Uh, and but it was a wave theory of light which explained it. And he presented this at the Royal Society in the 1800s, uh, which is long after Newton had died 70 years later. But Newton was so strong in his influence in the Royal Society and on science in general that this uh, paper uh, ruined Young's career. Uh, because it was the wave theory rather than the corpuscular theory of, of light. Um, and Newton and Hooke really didn't, didn't use the term diffraction. They sort of didn't believe in it because it would have meant they had to think about um, light in that sense. Anyway, Young's work was largely discounted in this country, but in other countries, um, it gained, gained some credibility. <coughs> Fresnel produced a geometric theory of diffraction based on Huygens' principle, which I won't explain, but his was a rather ad hoc approach, which could account for the fringe patterns it, uh, found in optical diffraction, um, and then the wave diffraction around rod slits, circular rectangular apertures, and circular discs. Dis and Helmholtz gave a mathematical basis to Fr Fresnel's work in the form of an integral equation, basically Green's theorem. But the real breakthroughs came later. Uh, Kirchhoff in 1882 uh, wrote, well, it's a book and uh, papers. Um, and Huygens, uh, Kirchhoff said, uh, the lack of rigor in many respects of, of Huygens and Fresnel's work um, was a stumbling point, and it does not seem possible today to develop a full satisfactory theory. Um, greater precision may, however, be given to these conclusions. So he's saying that up till now, the subject is really rather um, um, lacking mathematical uh, clarity and, um, and uh, solutions to equations, basically, that he meant. And Kirchhoff extended Helmholtz's ideas uh, and he came up with the idea that if you shine light through a screen, on the Scheiter side of the screen, uh, the field and its derivative are zero, which we know to be wrong. Okay. And on the aperture itself, the field is just the incident wave. So, so he came up with an attempt to, to sort of solve the equations, but he couldn't do it correctly. And at the time, people really didn't understand how to formulate a boundary value problem with the necessary boundary conditions as well as the governing equations. People had the PDEs, the governing equations, and were developing com complex analysis methods for finding solutions, but they didn't really understand how to put a whole boundary value problem together and think about existence and uniqueness of solutions. Um, his results revealed that Fresnel theory is accurate because the wavelength of visible light is very small in comparison with the diffracting body. So high frequency, which is good for, for optics, is, is fine. And Kirchhoff and Fresnel theory is, is good, but not good uh, otherwise. So we're now we're thinking about the trying to find a mathematical way of, of, of um, overcoming these difficulties. And we move on to Sommerfeld's uh, 1896 paper. So you see, we're talking about Young at the beginning of the 1800s. It's taken almost 100 years to develop this theory further to the point of having a, a mathematical solution. 
And this is really a towering paper in the discipline. This is the English translation, but this is what um, Sommerfeld says. Um, yeah, so um, theory of diffraction founded by Fresnel and made more precise analytically by Kirchhoff does not satisfy the requirements of mathematical rigor for various reasons. Um, and then he says, this theory owes its relatively good agreement with the experience merely due to the circumstances that the wavelength of light is very small. For the treatment of Hertzian oscillations and acoustic waves, in which the wavelength is significantly lower, it necessarily proves to be completely unusable. Okay, so, and also in optics. So he's saying we need to do better. And then he says, I'm going to try and do a rigorous treatment, but I'll limit myself to very simple cases. And then he'll talk about other stuff. So this was a, a big piece of work, 60 odd pages, pretty impenetrable. Um, but we'll try and explain what he did. Uh, and then this idea was picked up. Um, and then um, once we have canonical ways of approaching certain diffraction problems, then in the 1960s and 70s, Joe Keller, uh, the Courant Institute in New York, and a whole bunch of people developed a ge geometrical theory of diffraction, which has extended the idea of, of geometric optics, where light or other waves come in and they, they bounce off objects. So there's specular components or the mirror-like reflections. But you also have diffracted terms at sharp edges, uh, through diffraction, through apertures. And then you can get lots of phenomena, creeping rays, whispering gallery modes, lots of other things. And they did this through an asymptotic treatment of the certain equations that you get, or certain integrals representing the solution. And this was a general breakthrough. So once you have a geometric theory of this type, where you basically add various components together, then it allows you... Um, to um, get a good um, analytical solution or hybrid analytical numerical solution to the problem which captures the essential physical detail in it. So Sommerfeld's ideas are still very relevant today and people are still trying to extend these analytical tools that he and other people developed um, and put them in this GTD framework. <coughs> The half plane problem of Sommerfeld essentially is two dimensional. So and there's a rigid screen here. And the rigid screen extends to infinity in the Z direction, in all directions. So it's a purely two dimensional problem. We have some wave equation out here. We send some incident plane wave into this direction. And then we're going to get reflection off the rigid screen here. And then we're going to have some shadow boundary. Now, the normal optics view, according to Newton, et cetera, would be for very, very high frequency waves. You know that the waves will run, if you have a knife edge and just shine um, a pointer, you, this is the lit region here, this is unlit. And then here you'll get reflection off this mirror-like surface as well as the incident field. But in fact, we know that the solution out here of our differential equation must be continuous. So you, this sharp boundary, must actually be smoothed out. And this is the diffracted field. It smooths out these discontinuous regions in space. And that's what Sommerfeld wanted to try and achieve. So Sommerfeld worked in Göttingen. So he was well-schooled in complex analysis. He knew all of the, the others and, and indeed, um, um, yeah, had been seen many of the uh, advances in complex variable uh, work which had happened relatively recent to those times. His approach was to allow, so what he thought of was not to use complex analysis in the in some um, surrogate complex plane, but he wanted to get a representation where the physical space had a branch cut in it. So that screen was actually like a branch line. And so the solution didn't just exist between naught and two pi. So he wanted to think about going round physically for theta with naught to two pi. And then you went on to another 
sheet of the Riemann surface, but some physical Riemann surface. That's what he was trying to do. And his paper tries to argue this. Um, and then he discusses validity of Pancaro's and Kirchhoff's results. Um, but we're going to look at this, his approach by Coslaw's Law's approach. Coslaw was uh, a mathematician who was <laughs> British. He ended up his time in Australia, but he came and spent six months in with working with Sommerfeld, but Sommerfeld was so busy, he had lots of administrative jobs, etc., that um, essentially he gave some Sommerfeld gave him his paper and said, Well, work out what I've done there and see what else you can do. And he demystified it, and then he wrote a paper, and which was very influential in spreading Sommerfeld's uh, work, uh, ideas. And in fact, they were very, very soon picked up because Rayleigh and Lamb in the UK picked up on the work. And they were interested in elasticity and acoustics, where, again, the frequencies are much lower. So therefore, diffraction was much more important than in optics. So let's do a little bit of mathematics. OK, so let's take the wave equation. Phi here, if we're thinking of a fluid, uh, let's write that as a velocity potential. So the gradient of that is the velocity itself. OK, the gradient in u, it's usual. Uh, d phi dx is the, the x component of, the, of u, and d phi dy is the vertical component. And then the pressure is related to phi through this expression, minus rho d phi dt. OK, my subscripts here be mean partial derivatives. Now, if we assume we have some incoming wave which is oscillating with some fixed frequency component, and then we let all the transients settle down, and the whole field will just oscillate with that same uh, frequency, and therefore we can factor out time, uh, and then at the end we can multiply it by e to the minus i omega t, take the real part and get the full field. OK, so if we do that, then the wave equation reduces to the reduced wave equation or Helmholtz equation. So we've gone from a hyperbolic system to uh, elliptic. So that makes life easier. And then we just look for solutions of this. We don't worry about time anymore. And we know that if you have something like this, e to the i k x, you can see that's the solution of this equation trivially. If you multiply this by e to the minus i omega t and take the real part, then you get this, which is a right traveling wave. So by this choice, e to the plus i kx means a right traveling wave. So that's one solution of the wave equation. OK, let's look at it for the half, the half plane. So let's take our plane wave and incline it at some angle theta naught, then we got e to the i k x cos theta naught plus y sine theta naught. So this vector k is just a scalar k, which is omega over c cos theta naught sine theta naught. And x is r cos theta, uh, y r sine theta. OK, so this is all trivial stuff. So this means a wave inclined at some angle theta naught, propagating in the positive x direction and positive y direction. So Sommerfeld's idea was to create a general ansatz. So he said, well, if this is a solution of the wave equation for some angle theta naught, we can just change theta naught here to alpha. And alpha can be complex as well as real. It's not a plane wave anymore, but it's still a solution of Helmholtz's equation. And then we can just um, multiply by some weight function f of alpha and integrate over some some contour, any arbitrary contour in the complex plane. And that's a perfectly valid solution to the wave equation. So he's constructed a, a, a wave solution, uh, an ansatz for whole Helmholtz equation. OK, and um, you have to avoid infinities. So make sure your contour doesn't blow up at some points in F, or if you go to infinity in the wrong way, and this can blow up as well. 
Uh, so that should be okay. In particular, if gamma is a loop round theta naught of this integral, then this is equal to the instant wave. So you've just got some contour integral whose residue gives you uh, the incoming wave, which is this wave at some arbitrary angle. <laughs> this is Cauchy's integral theorem, which gives you this result, okay? So it's easy to show that that's, that's the case. Now, the clever thing to do is, is to take that loop integral around there, and then you pull it, you deform it, so you pull it up and pull it down. And in particular, uh, Sommerfeld let it go all the way off to infinity. And these striped regions here are where the real part of that um, exponent here is negative. So if you go off to infinity in this region, then this, this decays exponentially. In these regions, the this exponent gr uh, grows. So this is divergent. So you can't ever take your, your contour to infinity here or here or here or here. So you, you rotate it, you do that. So you pulled it up and pulled it down. And of course, you then have to join these to make a complete contour. So this is the same. I've not passed any singularities. I've not done anything naughty in the deformation. But because this thing is 2 pi periodic, then this contour and that contour are the same as each other in, in, in value, but they're opposite in direction. So they cancel. So what you're left with is that this integral is a contour gamma plus plus gamma minus. So that's a representation for the incident field. So the smart thing to do now is to think of other integrams that you can introduce. And, and in particular, they come up with came up with these ideas called multiform solutions. Let's introduce an alpha over n, where you had a just just alpha there, and a theta naught over n. So you've still got the pole here at theta naught, where this vanishes. But in fact, you've got images to that pole. Um, in lots of places further along here as well. But the periodicity of this is a lot bigger. So what he did then was to say, well, let's take this loop, stretch it out, but let's stretch it out and then take it all the way to, to this contour here and that contour here are the same, but again, opposite in direction, so they cancel out. So with an integral like this, the incident wave is equal to an integral which consists of, of these loops here and those loops there. Okay. And then if you start analyzing this, what you find is that, that this pair here and that pair there and this pair there are three representations of the solution in the physical plane, but they're all slightly different. And they're essentially solutions on three different sheets of the physical plane. You've come round through the cut and gone up another solution, another, and the three times up, you get back to where you started. So, wonderful. But we want the one which satisfies particular boundary condition on here. And that's what Sommerfeld wanted to do, construct a function which not only has a jump across this line, which he can't impose specifically with those choices he needs to alter it but but which has uh has some some prescribed boundary condition if we make it rigid that means the normal velocity is zero which is phi y equals zero so this is our boundary value problem this is what some of our recognized to have a complete boundary value problem you need to say something about what happens at infinity something at the tip because something peculiar can happen there it's it's it, it, it the field is is not uh, not simple, and then we satisfy the wave equation and some boundary conditions. And what you need to do is is have finite energy ben uh, density there, which means that phi is bounded, and the field as it's wavy must be outgoing. We can't allow anything coming in here except the incident wave.
<clears throat> so I've already said this boundary value problem has finite behavior or, or origin and is cut in the physical plane without going behavior in the diffractive field. Okay. In fact, n equals two is a solution we need for the Sommerfeld half plane problem. Um, so we need two images. So there's going to be two loops above and two loops below. But there's something more to satisfy this normal derivative is zero. We notice that the field must be odd um, in, in about theta equals zero. So, so, um, or as you go round, it's it's the value in the upper half plane is is the negative of the value in the lower half plane. So what you can do is you can fiddle around and essentially come up with this solution. So it's more or less what I showed you before with the exponentials, but you have to take the symmetry, this mirror symmetry, and then combine it together and it reduces to this form. So that is the solution that they came to for the half plate problem. And the contours are given in this very similar way we had them before. But now they're just, the solutions are just these loops, gamma plus, gamma minus. And if I want to, I can then take those contours and drag them down and turn them into these S-shaped contours plus the contribution around this pole here. Not in every uh, part of the physical space because theta and theta naught may cross over. So sometimes you pick up this pole and sometimes not. And these S-shaped contours um, have different form to these gamma plus gamma minus contours. Whoops. Um, so the solution is beautiful in many ways. If k are small, then you evaluate the loop integrals directly. So the gamma plus gamma minus, you could just numerically integrate those. If k are large, then you deform onto your S-shaped contours. And because of the fact that this is, you have to go around twice to, to get back to where you started, the S-shaped contribution, those contours don't cancel each other. So you pick up a contribution. And the S-shaped contours are steepest descent contours with saddles at theta minus two pi and theta and theta. And these give the diffracted field, which is outgoing as required. Then the instant wave and the reflected wave come in and out of my little contour, depending on where I am in the physical space. And it satisfies the, the boundary condition on the half plane and the, and the tip condition. So it satisfies everything. So in summary, the Sommerfeld integral approach is enormously powerful. It continues to be an invaluable tool, easily extended to 2D wedges, 3D cones of arbitrary co co cross sections. It took till the 1940s and 50s before they could handle impedance boundary conditions. So mixed and Dirichlet and Neumann condition combined. It's been used in electromagnetics, elasticity, acoustics, water waves, etc. So it's been incredibly powerful and it's still very, very popular. But the big downside is not constructive. You really pose an ansatz and you fish around to try and find the solution. Uh, and, and sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. So the Wiener Hoff technique came along, which tackled the same problem and many others, but it's a constructive method. So I'm going to have to finish talking very soon. And if uh, I'm going to talk for another four minutes. And then I'm clearly not going to have time to discuss the Wiederhoff technique, but at least I'll give you a little flavour of the, the two people, if I may. So the Wiederhoff technique was invented in 1931, and it was to solve a particular integral equation, nothing to do with diffraction theory. It was something proposed by Schwarzschild and Milne. Again, these are mathematical physicists, and they were looking about light heat in the outer part of the sun's atmosphere. Uh, and they were, had an integral equation, which was for radiative equilibrium in stars. But the method has proved to be incredibly um, 
useful in so many areas. Okay. And the integral equation they posed was this. They had a function which was the um, intensity of, of the radiation or light um, and it's was it equal to some integral of this exponential integral as the kernel uh, times f, you're unknown. So you're trying to solve that. Um, they wanted to find an exact expression. And in Hopp's book, he asked if it's useful to solve rigorously equations which are of an approximate nature. Um, so um, it's a good philosophical point. But he remarks, the answer to this is not always in the negative. So he obviously felt it was worthwhile to try and solve such equations rigorously, even uh, when you know that this equation is some sim simplified version of reality. But I think it's important. Anything that allows you to get a rigorous analytical solution gives you great insight, which is going to be useful. This integral equation has got no forcing to it. So you're looking for eigen solutions of it. And um, the difficulty comes from the fact that this is an integral between naught and infinity. And if it were between minus infinity, infinity, then Fourier transforms would allow you to solve this. You would smash it out. This is a convolution integral. So when you take Fourier transforms in X, this becomes the transform of F, and this would be the transform of E1 times the transform of F. And therefore, you, you manage to find an eigen solution of that. Okay. Just a couple of things about um, Hopf. He was born in Germany, uh, in Austria, but he worked most of his time in, in Germany. Um, he was the sort of academic grandson of David Hilbert, um, his interest with ODEs, PDEs, calculus variation, the Godic theory, you'll find him all over, huge figure in applied maths um, and functional analysis, etc. And he was interested in turbulence in particular and in radiative transfer, etc. Um, but he came over to um, America before the Second World War and um, Wiener managed to get him a position at MIT between 31 and 36. But Hopf, for some reason, moved back to Leipzig just before the First World War. This is when the, uh, the Hitler's government was in post. So it was very hard for people to understand his decision to, to return to Germany at that time. But after the war, he came back to um America and worked at Indiana University for the rest of its career. Brilliant writer and expositor, formal and discreet character. Wiener had difficulties. He was a child protege. He had his he he had a, a math degree at 14, PhD in Harvard in mathematical physics philosophy at 18. And then he tried to do a number of things after that. Um, he went to work with Bertram Russell, Hilbert, etc. cetera. Uh, and Wiener continued to be influenced by leading figures, including um, Levy and Landau and Bourne. He lived between statistics and probability theory, pure maths and applied maths, very, very broad. Uh, and he was stimulated by engineering questions because he ended up at MIT. And that was what he was sort of expected to do. But he was both a pure mathematician, an applied mathematician, a probabilist, etc. A very uh, difficult character, complex character. And he was Jewish. And also, um, it's well, well believed that he had difficulties uh, getting a permanent position because at that time in, in America, they had a quota on the number of Jews in each department. There was something like only two allowed. Of course, that's not the case now, but but it was a difficulty then. Uh, but he, despite his differences with Hopf, uh, managed to have this collaboration. And 
Wiener was the opposite of Hop. He was Hop. He was not easy to understand in any way. He was a famously bad lecturer. Okay. So how did they get on with each other? Jewish descent, one of them, one who consciously chose to return to Germany under Nazi rule. But mathematical interests trump political and social differences. Um, Wiener recognised the talents of Hopf. Hopf undoubtedly provided the problem. Wiener offered the initial trajectory of the solution, so who knows where it came from. But I'm not going to have time to talk about the method, other than that you can recast most diffraction problems, which involve a sort of knife edge or a semi-infinite geometry, into an integral equation, which has that naught to infinity range, and also a, a, a difference kernel, uh, and therefore it's a convolution type operator. And then the Wiener-Hopf methodology allowed the uh, solution to be obtained exactly. And that's allowed um, thousands of people to do, <laughs> uh, write thousands of papers in any areas from crystallography through optics, you know, and fracture mechanics, as well as diffraction theory to get solutions. Um, it has its own uh, drawbacks, which I've not got time to mention. But anyway, I'll stop there and thank you for your attention.